Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Chris. I'm our international developer evangelist. So that's the fancy title that I have in this company, which basically means I go out to the world and I tell them what cool stuff Yahoo does and what they can use it for. And then I come back to the company and tell the company what people want and what people think our product should be like and what other features we should put in there. It's a very unique and interesting, uh, uh, interesting job because I travel around the world and I meet developers from all over these uh, different places and with their different environments. It's quite funny to see when you work here and you have always your fastest connection and you have your newest computers and you, you have newest gadgets. You think this is what web development is. But if you go into countries like you go into the Indian countryside, you go to mainland China, you go to places like uh, rural France, then you realize you go into an internet cafe and there's these really old computers sitting there. And I've, it's always great and it's, uh, it's a humbling experience to realize we're building things for the web and nobody should be actually forced to use a certain technology, forced to use a certain gadget to actually see our website. It's like the great thing about web technologies is that they work everywhere. And this was the whole idea of the web and we shouldn't treat that badly nowadays. It's quite fun now with the iPad coming out and everybody's going nuts right now, like that will change the internet and we will build things completely differently. And I'm like, it's a $500 gadget that's not even out yet. So no, you don't change today because it might take four months in countries outside America to get this thing, if ever. And I mean, then you get an Australian one, which is always the wrong way around, these kind of things. It doesn't work that way. So I, was, I, was, I just want to be, do a quick talk about YQL and YUI and why I use these technologies to build websites and to build little web applications. And it's, the main point is I'm lazy. The main point is I've been doing this job for 12 years. I've built eToys.com. I built VisitBritain.com. All these websites that we had to support things like, uh, uh, like Netscape and other things like IE5. And it was just not fun. And nowadays we have the fun, but we don't treat the web the right way. We actually treat it like, oh, here's something cool and we put it out there and hope it works. We have the technology to make everything work out there, and YQL and YUI are two great examples for that. So I'm known to be able to quickly build cool demos. Whenever there's like a, a, a mashup competition or something, I get asked to go, come in and train people, and 24 hours before, like, and can you make a quick demo to do something like that? And normally it works out because I don't need much sleep, but it's quite funny to see how people always expect that of you quite quickly. And... Internally, we have this hack day here, 24 hours, and we show that if you let developers loose, if you don't breathe down their necks and you let them play, they can come up with great stuff. But a problem is that as developers, we always want to come up with our own stuff as well. So we have this little creature on our shoulder that tells us, you can do it better, you can do it in five lines of code rather than the 200 that YUI uses. And this is why we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot over and over again, because we don't release things. We just make another plugin for jQuery. We make another extension for another library. We make another CSS hack to make one solution that works in every browser right now, and next month it's broken because we want to do this. We're driven by that. And we shouldn't have to because, actually, if we want to build things for the web, think about the end users. Think about people, what they want to do with it. So some of the things I built, for example, when Yahoo Boss came out, uh, I was in France, in Paris, and the Boss team was there and was talking that we have keywords now in Yahoo Boss in the search results. And I'm like, great. So at the conference there, I started hacking this together, which is a keyword finder. So you, pay, you put in a keyword, it gets the first 20 results of Yahoo, gets the keywords of all these results, give it back to you as a list of keywords that you can copy and paste back into your keyword blog in your HTML page or in your content management system, or you can tag it this way and so on and so forth. So that was quickly put together, and it was a purpose that people wanted to have. And the, thing, the main thing that I wanted to show with it was the multi-language support as well, because that one was quite good in BOSS and still is. So I could have done that myself. I could have written the whole CSS and everything myself, but I didn't want to. I just used the CSS Grids Builder that I'm going to show later, put this thing together and concentrated on the back end and concentrated on writing the 50 lines of PHP that does the whole thing. News Mixer, was, I was asked to do that for the Guardian release. The Guardian newspaper in the UK released a, an, a really, really good, uh, good API. So you can get all the uh, Guardian content as XML and as JSON, and it's completely searchable and filterable and so on and so forth. And 24 hours before they released it, they basically said, we need more hacks because we want to show some to the press what you can do with our, with our demo. And the problem was, of course, 24 hours before, they just released the API key, so nobody else had a chance to build something before that. So I did it last time I was here on the way out, 
uh, on the way to the airport. I uploaded it next morning. I presented it in London. Same thing. I used YQL for the data. I used YUI for the interface, and it works, and I don't have to worry about it. GeoMaker is when we, when we release Placemaker. Placemaker is an absolutely amazing API, and there's nobody in the competition that has the same API. You give it a URL, you give it an RSS feed, or you give it any text, and it gives you back the geolocations in this text, and also does the disambiguation for you. So it finds London, England first, London, Ontario second. It, uh, when, you, when you look for Paris, you don't find Paris Hilton, you find Paris France. And it does this really nicely. The only problem is, it's a POST API. You have to sign up for an API key, and people didn't know how to use a POST API, sadly enough. People still are out there that have this kind of problem. So I used YOI uh, to build this interface, used Yahoo Maps to allow you to input your things, filter out the results using data table from YOI, and then it generates a map for you for copy and paste, or gives it your text back as uh, microformatted geo data already. Copy and paste it in. Fourth of July, um, slow news day, tech uh, TechCrunch actually reported about it. Nearly killed my server. But it was good. For the first time, TechCrunch said something nice about us. It's good. This quick trans is a uh, W3C widget for mobile phones. I was asked by Vodafone to be a, a judge at a competition. They had a 24-hour competition to build W3C widgets for their mobile phone platform. And I needed a demo, so I didn't know what to do. So I basically used uh, the Google Translate API with YQL and allowed you to translate something on your mobile phone. I got back home after giving my talk and after coaching some people, said like, okay, why not put it in the competition? A week later, I had a new mobile phone and a laptop because I won first prize with this. But this is basically, other people thought about the greatest, coolest, best looking solution. It didn't work. It, didn't, it wasn't finished. It didn't, it didn't do anything for end users. This makes sense. If I go out in a pub and I want to have a German beer, I know how to call it here now. This was uh, uh, another demo when people asked me about, like, how can, how can you use the different APIs of search engines? That's Goohoobie, which basically uses Google, Yahoo, and Bing next to each other. And uh, it has an interface where you can see the results, and it's great for researching something if you want to just quickly see the different search engines going out there. Bit of a problem because Google Ajax API has really strange content compared to the Live API, but they're working on that as well. But this one is available also as a screencast, how I built this thing in 30 minutes using YQL and YUI without actually, no, well, not the styling. The styling was another half hour, but fair enough. But this is how easy it is to, do, uh, to build something like that quickly. UK house prices was asked, uh, I was asked to do something for the UK government data release, like data.gov in, in America. We have UK data.gov right now. And one of the things was a, uh, um, a CSV, uh, well, an Excel sheet with the house prices in England over the years. And this is what, uh, what was released, and uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee showed it, and it was in all the newspapers in the, US, in the UK. And it was built within a day as well using out-of-the-box components. You can see here this is the slider from, uh, from YUI. This is the uh, autocomplete from YUI, the YUI button, and then I did a little graphing engine. I'm going to come back to that. And down there, I'm doing a YQL call to Nestoria, which gives you house prices that are currently available in the area, which is very, very depressing if you earn as much as I do and you live in London. The reason is that I, uh, why I can build these things quickly is that I build them with things that work. And I don't have that passion anymore to say, like, I've got to do it myself. I could write an autocomplete. Yes, I could write a, uh, spend a day on writing another autocomplete solution. But there's a great one in YUI. There's lots and lots of plugins for jQuery. There's lots and lots of in Dojo. Everybody solved that problem already. Why do I have to do that again? Because my ego tells me to, rather than like, what does the end user get out of it? And if we have something like YUI, if we have something like that that is documented like that, that has great examples like that, look at those and use them rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Because there's new wheels to be built. There's new good stuff out there that we should concentrate on. But no, we do the same things we've done five years ago. And it gives me time to concentrate on the important things about the application. And the important things about the application are two things to me. It's the data that the application has. If there's nothing in, of interest in there, why should I use it? That's the biggest problem if people come up with new social networks right now. Let's make a social network. Well, what is your social network about? It's about connecting to your friends and following each other. That's been done before. If you don't have a social thing in the middle that people care about emotionally, you're not going to be successful. Twitter is the... the the, the, the way around, but partly it's also because people want to stalk celebrities. That's why people follow Douglas Crockford on Twitter a lot and these kind of things. So 
the other thing is for me is the interface. The interface should work, and the interface should work for everybody. It's just scary. I've been doing accessibility, web accessibility, for about 10 years. And I still see people doing the same things over and over again. They build a flashy interface, and then they try to make it accessible. And you're like, this is not working anymore. You're going to spend two months on that. It's not going to work out. Whereas if you use plugins that actually work, like the area plugins of YUI, you have a certain amount of accessibility, even in the most uh, interactive element. And you don't have to think about it, or, or you should help us make it better rather than trying to shoehorn accessibility into it. And like, there's this button if you want to have the non-JavaScript version, and you load that one, and we don't maintain that anymore. So it's just don't expect anything out there to be there for you. There's terrible browsers out there. There's terrible computers out there. There's terrible companies out there that don't allow people to, to, uh, to install things. They don't allow people to upgrade. That's why we have things like IE6 floating around. It's not people that are evil that say, I don't upgrade because I want to see a shit website. It's people that have an IT department that tells them, you cannot upgrade, it's insecure. I had flat out people telling me they cannot upgrade from IE6 to IE7 because IE7 is insecure. I don't know why, but this is basically what, what I heard. And these are the kind of things that we have to deal with. So I'm bored of writing CSS layouts. That's one of the things that annoyed me of, over the last few years. CSS is not a good way of laying out information. It's good for what it does. It's good for styling things. It's OK what, what you can do with it. But it's, every CSS layout right now is a hack. Floating is a hack. Positioning is a hack. And we just have to hope it works in browsers. And if there's a rounding error of the percentages, we have a drop float, all kind of things happening. So no, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to use the technology, and I want the browsers to behave. I don't want to work for browsers. I want to work with technology. And this is why libraries are out there to help us with that. So that's why whenever I start with a new CSS layout, I use a very simple solution, and that is the CSS Grids Builder. That's done by Dave Glass. was originally, I think, in an internal hack day, and then we released it for the YUI. And this one allows you to build your layout, click it together, here row, there row, there's three, uh, three columns, there's two columns, and so on and so forth. And you can see it immediately, what's it going to look like. And then you basically press a button, and you get the code back for you. Copy and paste it out, start putting your content in. This is three hours of hacking CSS that I saved myself. I don't have to do that anymore. It will work. Yes, if, you, if the styling is different, go nuts. Do your own layout. It's, it's, it's great. But for me, for my kind of applications, this is exactly what I want. I want to make it work. I don't want to make it like five pixels here, three pixels there, twi two half pixels and a drop shadow there. This is for me is not the web anymore. Because when you see MacBooks, netbooks, mobile phones, we don't have a chance to actually say anything about the interface. We have to make the interface flexible so that it actually helps people to read our things rather than just have scroll bars all over and hope it works out. The reason is that I want to support browsers and not work for them. I want to support a browser. Yes, you can come with any browser to my website. You will get something. You will get something that works for you. I don't want to spend another six hours to make something work for Safari 103 or Opera 5. I don't want to do that. This is not, not what I'm here for. I'm here to deliver cool content with an interesting interface to people out there. Browsers are not my clients. People are my clients. So Safari, uh, uh, Firefox, Opera, Chrome, all great browsers. Then there's also Internet Explorer. But yeah, we should, we should give them something. Give them HTML and CSS. If JavaScript is too much for Internet Explorer, fair enough. Why not? Nobody's going to miss it. It's quite amazing how many times we spend, we spend hours fixing things for Internet Explorer 6. Anybody who does that, go home, into, install Internet Explorer 6, and surf the web for two hours. You want to shoot yourself. It's really not a fun experience. It's really not nice to have. So people are already OK with that. They're already used to a bad experience. So don't give them something extra. It's, it's like this, this, this uh, uh, Stockholm syndrome of people trying to defend a browser that should have died years ago. So I'd rather be able to update a CSI, CSS URI than rewrite my CSS when a new browser comes around. That's the biggest problem with any engineering out there. With any development, we always think we have the best solution now ever. And then in half a year's time in the web, our, in, our environment changes completely. Something new comes out, iPhone, iPad, maybe something from Microsoft too, you don't know. And um, it messes with up with what we've done. And once again, we're like, oh, now it works for every browser. Like my favorite are tutorials, works in modern browsers, especially when they say 2004 in the date and something like that. Modern browser is like a moving target. You cannot build for them. So 
things you spend far too much time on. Hacks to make browsers work. Oh, these rounded corners don't work in Internet Explorer 6 without 16 pictures. Don't give them rounded corners. Problem solved. Optimizing prematurely. Oh, my JavaScript now uses five cycles on this, uh, on this processor and six cycles on that processor. And no. Optimize when it hurts. Where it hurts your end users, don't optimize on a language level where you might be, in this case, an Internet Explorer in that version. And there's a great talk at uh, Full Frontal this year in, uh, in Brighton uh, by uh, Jake Archibald from the BBC. He basically gave a talk that was uh, called Optimize Where It Hurts, where he basically went through a lot of like optimization and performance blog posts and took out some truisms and actually debunked them completely with proper testing, with proper uh, uh, examples on the BBC website. And it's just amazing how happy we are to cut down on like two lines of code. But then we don't have time to make it available for a blind user or somebody without JavaScript. So optimize where it makes sense rather than prematurely. So I, I saw that in the company a lot, that we don't release products quickly because we want to make them scale for 16 million users that might not show up at all. I mean, Twitter doesn't scale. <laughs> it's still out there. And it's basically get things out. Don't optimize them. Using our pet language environment or library is something that drives me nuts as well. Every time I write a cool tutorial on YUI, the first, 20, uh, the first 20 comments are, this is great. Can you do it in jQuery as well? Or can I do that in Dojo? Or can you use it in .NET for really sick people? <laughs> so yeah, if something is out there in jQuery that's cool, use it. Use it. Don't say, oh, we have to do it in YUI now. Don't, don't, don't go out and, and try to evangelize people into another library. It's about solutions. It's not about the library that we use. And if you write PHP and you love PHP, write it in PHP. If you like Python, write it in Python. Not a problem either. As long as you write maintainable code that is understandable by other users, you're a good developer. If you write in the same environment for 10 years and your code is only understandable to you and the two guys next to you, then we have a problem. I remember seeing source code with Korean comments. That was great. Talking of which, reading badly written tutorials and incomplete documentation is another thing that people waste their time on. There's so many books out there that are written in a fluffy, happy way. So you read the book and you feel like you're a JavaScript god after the first three, li three lines or after the first two pages because it gives you this, oh, yeah, document write is the best thing ever. You only have to use that in JavaScript. CSS, yeah, yeah, um, just make sure you order all your uh, properties in alphabetical order. Then you have great CSS, these kind of things. And uh, it's amazing how many people read documentation and then wonder when it doesn't work and haven't looked at the date of the documentation or the tutorial. You know, it's like if it's from 2000, it's probably not going to be good advice right now. It might be, I mean, Dr. Crockford's website is an example, but fair enough. Then we use bleeding edge effects and interfaces, and then we try to create a fallback solution. Start with the thing that works, then make it fancy. This is all it takes. This is the main trick about web development. Start with something that works for everybody, then make it fancy. Don't make the drag and drop solution on the cube in 3D with light sourcing and then wonder why somebody without a mouse can't use it. This is not how we should build things. And then we build flashy effects all the time. What we really should start with is data. And this is basically, I love data. I love information on the web. I love that the governments throw out all the, all the information right now. There's so many cool things that you can build, build nowadays. And it's amazing if somebody like government realizes it's a great thing to give information out to the people. We should use it. We should do something with that and show them what it can be done. It was interesting with the data uh, competition of the UK government because they hardly found people to write hacks for them. Because a lot of geeks were like, oh, that's working with the government. You're bringing it back to the man. That's just not it. We're not punk. We're not hardcore. We're web developers. It's different. There's like <laughs> it's quite interesting to see that how hardcore some people are. And this is where APIs and web services come in. And APIs and web services are, oh, is it like 4,470 or something on programmer web right now? And the problem with them is that all of them are written by developers as well. And every developer thought this is the best way how to build an API. This is the best way how to authenticate for one. And this is the best way of getting information out. So all of them are completely different. And we spend most of our time using four or five APIs, reading the documentation about it that normally doesn't exist. So we even have to find that somewhere or ask somebody. And then we don't get the data back that we want. So they're written differently. They expect different authentication. And they give back different data, even in like interesting formats. Main government data format, RDF and Sparkle. 
Sparkler I hadn't even touched since two, uh, 1997, 1998 when I first came around with this kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. And this is why we built YQL. Jonathan here, other people built this awesome product called YQL. And this is by far the coolest thing we have at the moment. YQL is a, uh, a SQL style language for web services and web data. It's basically your data interface to the web that you don't need to know anything about authentication. You don't need to know anything about like uh, what data goes in, what data comes out. You don't have to read documentation. All of it is in one interface and it works for you. So you have select what from where, where uh, from where, where conditions. And this is what we had to use internally. When we wanted to use Flickr, uh, when we wanted to use Yahoo Answers, and we wanted to use sports on one website, we were trying to go through Twiki pages and talking to people for five hours finding this information. With YQL, we now have it in one interface where we can click it together. So this is a, one of the demo examples that I always show. It's like this is 50 lines of PHP that gives me a static website about Frankfurt or Paris or London or Sunnyvale. So I, I scrape the first three paragraphs from Wikipedia, I show a Yahoo map next to it, I get Yahoo weather, I get events from upcoming, and I get geolocated photos from Flickr. So this can be done nowadays in like 20 lines of code using YQL. Like this would have won a hack day six years ago because it would have been eight hours of work trying to make this thing work and filter together and, and get the right information out. But with YQL, it's really, really easy. YQL also is not us. It's, it's everybody. It's like everybody on the web can be part of YQL. All you have to do is write an XML schema, point to your data endpoint, and then give us, uh, give us an open table on GitHub that we will copy over to datatables.org, and you are part of this interface. And I've just spoken to LinkedIn two days ago, and I'm talking to Google tomorrow about some of the other stuff that they haven't released yet. And it's just amazing. If you go through the YQL console right now, you see every startup that has good data. You see every big data set in there. We have it for you. You don't have to go through the Bing documentation and uh, reload frames randomly and these kind of things. So a few examples. Select star from Flickr photo search where text is donkey. Finds you photos from Flickr where the text or the description or the file name is donkey. And this was before that. You had to go to the Flickr authentication. You have to get your OAuth key. You got to get the data back. So most of the time when people did something with Flickr before, they used the RSS output rather than the API. But now you can use the API with full text search and actually get the information back. Select star from Flickr photo search where text is donkey and license equals four. Very important, if you ever show Flickr photos online, make sure that they have a Creative Commons license because otherwise a lot of Flickr people will come down on you like a ton of bricks. And I had that before, that people, oh, you stole my, my pictures and Google indexed my photo on your website on page 215 with that search term. And I'm like, well, that's terrible but I will ask them to delete it, it's good. Select star from Craigslist search, where selection is SFBay, type is SSS, and queer, uh, query is flower pot. In case you wanna have a flower pot around here, you can now find that with a line of code, rather than having to go through the whole of Craigslist and trying to, find, trying to use their search. Select star from Google News, where query is healthcare. What's happened on Google News right now about healthcare? How about you compare things? Select star from query multi, which is uh, you list uh, several queries and they get run one after the other, where you say select from New York, New York Times article search where it's healthcare, Microsoft Bing News where it's healthcare, Google News where it's healthcare, get it all back as on interface, you can build Google B again quickly. This is basically how I built that. And this is how easy as it is. And it's great for comparison of different, uh, different sources rather than having to click through them one by one. Uh, interesting is when people don't have an API, you can still do, make an API out of a certain website. This is, for example, Fox News. Select content from HTML, where URL is httpfoxnews.com, and xpath is slash dash h2 slash a. So every link that is in an h2 gets, uh, gets uh, well, it goes to foxnews.com, uh, gets the HTML, runs it through HTML tidy, so even if somebody used a content management system, HTML will come out in the end. And then you can use XPath to filter it down to only what you want. In this case, only the links that are inside headlines, and then give me the content of those links. This content is hard to find, because sometimes you just, uh, in the documentation, we have to fix that a bit. And then you can, for example, take the headlines and translate them into French if you want to. So you have the power of all the web services, of all the data sources of the web, in a language like this, rather than having to go through beautiful soup in Python or PHP frameworks or whatever. Or even uh, uh, read, uh, update, delete, and insert. So this, for example, would allow you to, up, uh, to send something to a, a WordPress blog. 
so you can write an interface where people can block to their own WordPress blog using this line of code. Go over HTTPS, because otherwise the password and username is, uh, is visible in public. It's not too good. But uh, it's just amazing that you can do this. And it's just fun to build little interfaces using this, uh, using this YQL. So it has a lot of benefits. There's no time wasted reading API docs. And I've written several API docs. I help people writing API docs. I translated them. Most of them are terribly bad. And they're really, really hard to understand. And uh, most of the time, things are explained that you don't need. And the simple things are not. So going through the console, you just get the data, you use it, you mix it up with another interface, done. Using the console makes it easy to create com uh, complex queries as well. Because you will get error messages that really, not, that really are meaningful. It says, like, this should be Q instead of text. This, should be, uh, this data comes back as an, uh, as an integer rather than a sing, uh, string. That's why it doesn't work. So it gives you error messages that work, not like undefined is not defined or null is not an object. You can filter the data down to the least amount necessary before you use it. This is a very important thing as well. Most of the time with APIs, you get a massive chunk of data, and then you have to become the regular expression god, or you have to filter it with some other system to get it down to the one that you only want to have. Whereas with, uh, with YQL, you can filter it down with, lo uh, with local and with remote, uh, remote filtering. You can say, give me only the first five. Start at the, first, at the 10, give me the next 40. Filter them by date, sort them by date, sort them alphabetically. All of this is possible, and you get, in the end, you get a little chunk of JSON or XML back rather than having to calculate that. On a computer, that's not a problem, but in a mobile device, for example, this is a very, very powerful thing to have. So instead of 6,000 lines of XML, you have like 60 lines of XML only with the data that you need. And it has fast pipes. I mean, the YQL team keeps telling our pipe is bigger than yours. That's why you should use our servers. And I've done some testing with this. It's actually quite impressive if you use YQL as a proxy, what you can do in terms of speed of your applications. It caches and converts it for you into formats that are usable, like XML and JSON, rather than like RDF and Sparkle. And the caching is actually quite good as well, because uh, that means you, you, next time you hit the same query, query term, it's terribly, terribly fast. One thing that gets me very excited as well is server-side JavaScript. So in open tables, in the table definitions of YQL, you can embed JavaScript if you need to do complex filtering. Like you say, give me all uh, links that start with A and have the word dog in them. That's something you cannot do easily in YQL. So you can write a line of JavaScript to do that for you and give the data out. So what I'm doing with that a lot is I'm, I'm taking data that is coming back as XML and I convert it into HTML and send it back to you so you don't have to do that on your PHP or JavaScript anymore. It's a very powerful way of using JavaScript. This is a speed test that I've done. Um, it's been released on, on, on some performance blog as well, where I, I read five different uh, RSS feeds and, uh, and, uh, and printed them out and measured the time that it took to do them. That was yesterday night in the hotel. So um, with a simple curl, like a curl request for each and every one of these RSS feeds is 10 seconds. With a multi-curl, it was 4.35 seconds. With a YQL curl test, it was 0.9 seconds. And with executable YQL with conversion on the server, it was 1.6 seconds. The second time I ran this, this went, even, uh, this went down even more. The main point was that my computer did not have to connect to these five different random servers all over the world to get the data back, because I connected to the YQL server, and the YQL server has a fatter pipe than my desktop in a hotel room. And out of a sudden, I cut down on the time my application needs immensely. If you hit that a second time, the caching kicks in. It's even a lot less. Using YQL itself is terribly easy because YQL itself is a uh, web service. So all you have to do is you take your data, you take your structure together so you don't have to use the console. You say, you, you select statement here, Flickr photo search with a start and the end, where if there is a, a where on earth ID, where the where on earth ID is this, and the text is that. And then you, p you point it to the uh, query endpoint of YQL, the public query endpoint, URL encode it, do a curl call, and you're done. You get it back as JSON, you do a JSON decode, and then you have your object in PHP that you can loop over, that you can write HTML out, they can do whatever you want. This is all you really need to do to have your first YQL statement out in the wild. If you don't like PHP or you are in an environment where JavaScript is the only thing you have available, like widget platforms or some mobile phone devices, um, you can just do the same thing in JavaScript with JSONP. So you do select star from Flickr places where lat and long, and encode the URI component, send it as a, uh, put it together as a URL string, Create a script element, set the URL, put it into the head, and the output function will be called as soon as it gets the data back 
then test if something, something has been released, uh, returned, and then alert it out. This is how easy it is to do it in JavaScript. Another really interesting thing about YQL is an output format called um, JSON-PX, which is, an, uh, if you say the output format should be XML, but uh, you give it a callback parameter, you get a JavaScript callback with an object that has the HTML as a string in it, rather than as a massive JSON object that you have to put together as a string again. Very powerful for little widgets and like if you want to scrape some websites. So what I tend to do with YQL is build APIs that render out HTML, because I'm tired of like writing the same for loops in JavaScript or in PHP all the time. So basically I write a little PHP script that does a curl call, renders out HTML, and I can use that anywhere I want to. So, for example, this, the example that we had here, we had a photo ID on Flickr. We do Flickr photos info with photo ID is ID, do a curl call, get the data back, and write out a paragraph with a link to the right, to the right uh, um, uh, URL on Flickr with the name of the user with a proper alternative text and information about the license as well. So I'm writing a lot of HTML out, and in the end, I just write out the, uh, I echo out the HTML. This means now that I can actually use it as an include in PHP. I can use that in any, in, uh, in any other platform when I would use it in iframe if I wanted to. But it also means that I can reuse it for my JavaScript solution as well. So instead of doing this, the whole thing in JavaScript over and over again, I just write one single PHP script that I can use in two places. So an API like that allows me to build non-script version and reuse it with Ajax for Slicker experience. So, and you can send it out to the outside world as well. So that's another thing. Like every time I build something with little APIs like that, in the end I build the interface and then I say little link API, you can use it yourself. Like GeoMaker, the, the map platform they saw earlier, that one has an API and three other websites are using that at the moment, which is quite cool because I just didn't want to answer their questions how they can do it themselves. So to build the interface then, I normally use libraries and yes, we are in Yahoo, and I used the YUI for several years, and uh, it's still my favorite because it actually teaches you good development practices while you use it. That's what I like about YUI the most, and it scales up to our size. That's the other thing about it. There's Dojo. I played with Dojo as well. It's pretty good. There's MooTools and jQuery. jQuery is probably the most out there that people will talk to you about, and I've been using it as well for a long time. I'm... I'm not that happy with either of them, really, because I'm a JavaScript guy. I normally get this, this little feature on my shoulder, like, I can do it too. But don't, don't. JavaScript is just so broken in browsers right now. Browsers are so broken with JavaScript that it makes so much more sense to use a library to make things work rather than hoping it works with your own JavaScript. So then you get all these awesome, awesome articles nowadays, like 37 more shocking jQuery plugins, 50 plus amazing jQuery examples, 45 query navigation plugins and tutorials, 37 plus great Ajax CSS tab-based interfaces, 45 fresh out of the oven jQuery plugins, I didn't know you have to cook them, 30 JavaScript Ajax techniques for slider scrollers and scroll bars, exceptional Ajax JavaScript techniques recently created, 10 smart JavaScript techniques for manipulating content, free slideshows, gallery, and lightbox scripts. Stop this. It's unbelievable how much bad, bad, uh, uh, like, blog posts and tutorials are out there right now because everybody built an own plugin. Everybody builds an own jQuery plugin. So, hey, we can write another blog post. This one now does the fade in blue rather than yellow. So, yeah, that was necessary to have a new plugin for that. Great idea. So we have all this stuff out there, and I get these, I don't know, I, I sound old now, but I've been, I've been web developing for so long, I remember the DHTML tutorials, like animated menus that work in Netscape 4 and Internet Explorer 5. And it's the same thing over again. It's just a different technology, and it's, we run in the same trap of like building things for ourselves rather than building things that make sense for the end users. So build interfaces that work. So here we have the UK house prices thing again, which is the autocomplete, for, this, for the uh, city you want to get in, the date range for the date you want to see, then there's the charts down there, a little map, and direct link, download CSV, delete, all these things work because they're YUI and they're tested across browsers. But what if JavaScript is turned off? And the problem is that a lot of these examples then give you data that don't work. In this example, I have a dropdown for the, uh, for the autocomplete and I have a dropdown for the slider. And I'm using these as the data source for the autocomplete and for the slider, rather than maintaining it somewhere else in an extra, jQuery, uh, in an extra uh, JSON block or whatever. It makes much more sense that way, because it's in my page already, so why don't I just reuse it? So 
The charts were quite interesting as well because I wanted to build this thing to be, uh, to can I thought it would be hit a lot with, with the press in the UK going for it. And I also wanted to reuse it in another environment, which I'm going to come back to later. So I, charting solution was my big problem because there's Google Visualization API, awesome. Best if you want to do something with charts just with a URL, great. There's like high charts, there's uh, uh, ajax.org, there's all kinds of platforms, there's YUI, uh, there's the YUI charts, but all of them were rather heavy. They either, either used images or they used canvas or they used flash, and I didn't want to have to do that. So I basically wrote, it, uh, wrote them in pure, in pure CSS. And this can be done nowadays. So basically that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the HTML, and with a few lines of CSS, they turn into these bar charts right now and a PHP script that actually writes out the, inner st uh, the, the styles, the internal styles that are necessary for that. And this can be done nowadays with browsers. This is where cre being creative comes in, in benefit. Like not like, oh my god, I just used the 15 level drop down menu with fading in CSS only, great. But this CSS only makes sense. The rollover is not really necessary. The information is still there. Because in IE6, the, the rollover doesn't work. But uh, for all the other browsers, done. We don't have to write any JavaScript for that. The API in itself was, yeah, ukhouseprices.com, and then you have, have a start and a location and an end, and that one renders out plain HTML as well that I can use in the, in the system itself with an AJAX call, or I can embed it into another document again. And then I basically said, okay, let's write the JavaScript now. This is, it works. It worked for everybody. Dropdowns work. The PHP works. And then I said, okay, let's do for JavaScript. First thing I did was go into the uh, configuration thing of YUI, where you basically click together what you want to have of the YUI and you get it back as one single URL to put in your document. And this is amazing. This is what I love about it. I don't like these like one size fits all library solutions that give you 15 meg of JavaScript and you will probably need this in three weeks time. The great thing about YUI 2 and YUI 3 even more is the granularity. It gives you only what you need, which came with a bit of confusion like what do I need to include when and this is why this configurator is absolutely perfect for that. Just click it together. You either get it as a URL to embed into your page or even as a JavaScript to load it on demand. And this is what we should be using for our things. Then I went to the autocomplete control, looked at one of the examples, copied and pasted the example, and started messing around with it. Because this is what developers do. We don't go for documentation. We take one of the examples that you put, and then we mess around with it as long as we can so it actually makes sense. And if we break it, we complain that there is no documentation. And <laughs> Then, we can, then the people of the documentation point out there is documentation, you just haven't looked, and you're already bored of it. So good examples, and this is my talk on Thursday, good coding examples are the most important thing we do out there. Code examples that we put out in documentation should be the best code you write, because this is what people copy and paste. This is what people think good code is as well, because it comes with a Yahoo label on it. So if our code examples are bad, then it is bad for the people out there. So I took the, uh, the autocomplete basic array function then I took the slider example, copied and pasted that one, and then I started my own JavaScript. I put them all together in a page. The great thing is all of them work together. That's cool. But it also was quite interesting to see it that you can, when you know the developers, and even if you don't know, you see where different developers come from in their coding style. So all of the examples were a bit different, so I had to clean them all up to make them one st my style, really. Again, and that, then they work together. And then I said, okay, let's do JavaScript. And then I started getting evil. Because uh, um, I tried it out in our uh, reception area, because that's the only IE I've got access to right now, because my parallels died. And it didn't work there, so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm annoyed now. I have to release that tomorrow, so let's block out IE. Let's give IE the, the, just the example without JavaScript. It works. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to complain anyways. So this is probably the cleverest way and the most evil way at the same time to test for Internet Explorer. Is MSIE CC on uh, 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 exclamation mark false? So in every browser, this, this actually comes out as is MSIE is false. In Internet Explorer, it comes out as is MSIE exclamation mark false, which is true. <laughs> so it is amazing that, uh, that Internet Explorer in JavaScript has this inline conditional comments. You don't have them in CSS where they would be useful. It only in JavaScript you can do inline conditional comments or conditional whatever they call it. But it's pretty cool to actually have one line of JavaScript to reliably say this is Internet Explorer. No matter what, this will always work. So uh, then you say if is, if, is, if is MSIE is false, which means it's a browser, um, 
I hide the JavaScript block. I uh, I show the non-JavaScript. Uh, I hide the non-JavaScript block. I show the JavaScript block. This is basically just hiding the drop downs. I keep them in the document because if you find them still with a screen reader, you can still use them. I didn't want to delete them or anything. I just hide and show them. That's that. Then I have a namespace. I create a script node and call my widgets function, which is basically all the code that came with it. So there I do shortcuts for the uh, uh, for the YUI uh, different controllers like util DOM, util event. I do the init slider, which I copied and pasted more or less from that example and clean it up a bit. I do the autocomplete. You can see that I read out the selects in, an, uh, in a for loop here and get the data into the autocomplete that way. So I, I store the things that are in the HTML already and reuse it in the fancy autocomplete. I set up my response scheme and I do a for selection, use shadow, and so on and so forth. And then I basically have a uh, set a value of a location when the drop down has finished. I do my init charts thing, which basically is only just setting classes so the charts get displayed. And on DOM ready, I test for MSIE, I do the init slider, init charts, and so on and so forth. Actually not necessary really because I only included it with if it's not MSIE, but anyways, it's, it didn't hurt. So this is all the code that I had to do by copying and pasting things that have already been done and cleaning them up a bit. And let's not, let's not uh, say uh, this is bad practice because this is what everybody out there does. It's not that people go and read our documentation or read a YUI book and then start using YUI. I mean, there's great examples. If, you want, if people want to learn more, send them to our documentation, send them to the main page. Klaus here has a great, uh, um, a great uh, a group of, uh, of blog posts introducing YUI in James Bond style. It was absolutely cool, really well written. And we have to do more of that. So the other thing that I use this application for, as I build it with YUI and as I build it with an API to get the data, I can easily put it into our own platform right now to run it on the Yahoo homepage. So this is the same application, more or less, with a little bit of different styling because I don't have a head and a body. But this is, this is what it is. So I could reuse that whole information in two different spaces because I built in unreusable components and I didn't start from scratch every time I wanted to. So... This is what I spent yesterday night on because um, uh, Eric keep telling me that I use YUI 3 now as well. So I spent, uh, I spent a few hours with YUI 3. And this is what I built for myself for starters, and I'm going to release it as soon as I cleaned it up a bit. So this is now using YUI 3 to, uh, to search Flickr with YQL and allow me to actually put together photos for copy and pasting into a, word, uh, into a blog post, for example. So we can quickly switch to that, I think. So, too many tabs. So this one now is, uh, if, I, if I just reload it, without JavaScript, this is all I would get. I would get the, the, the one down, down there, the drag to collect and drag to remove would not be visible at all because I create that with JavaScript because it doesn't make any sense without JavaScript. So every time you have something in the page that when you turn off JavaScript, that is dependent on JavaScript, you've done something wrong because you promise people functionality that you don't deliver. And that's a terrible thing to do. So what you can do here is you can basically just click on the different images. Of course, the first search is for kitten because we need that. And then you find the license here and you can copy and paste it into your blog post already if you wanted to. If you find more kittens that you like, you can start dragging them. And you drag them into your collection box. If you realize this, is one, this one is ugly, I don't want to have that, then you can remove it. You can drag others into the box, and you can do search for donkeys, then these kind of things. So all of this is using a few lines of PHP, a few lines of YQL, and YUI components that once again came out of the box, and I had to shift around a bit and clean up a bit for myself. So for some reason, donkey gives me cars. That's not useful. So I want to have a real donkey. So there's a real donkey. There we go. So I can click through that, or I can uh, preview those again, and so on and so forth. If I'm happy with all the donkeys and all the cat kits that I have, I can see all the code, copy and paste it here, and I get the whole, pay, uh, the whole code back with the copyright uh, and the license and the people that if I want to, uh, want to mention them at the end of my blog post, done. All of this, could have, could have, uh, uh, I could have written it myself. I could have written it myself in clean JavaScript, but using YUI 3, and using these kind, of, uh, these kind of APIs, it was really easy to do. So the Thumbs API, for example, here does a, a, a curl call to, to YQL and then writes out my HTML, like I showed in the other examples as well. 
The same is like the full view does the same thing if you send an ID through and I've got the different licenses here and so on and so forth. All of this is like a few lines of code put together. And the YUI3 code, all of this will be on GitHub once I clean it up a bit, is like 123 lines of code. And that's because I've been verbose with the like variables and things like that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have all the things out there. And YUI3 YUI is completely open source. It's completely out there for you to extend, for you to make cool things with. And we should do that. So back to Keynote. Kids these days. This is uh, the University Hack Day in Dundee in Scotland on the left-hand side, uh, on the right-hand side. And these were the two winners, two uh, uh, like 18-year-old ladies that won one of our hack days. So every time people say, oh, not enough women in IT. There are. You just have to find them. That's a problem. And uh, the other one is the, um, uh, is the Young Rewired State, which was a hack event from 14 to 18-year-olds to build government hacks. And I was completely amazed by these events because all these kids came in, had no idea what JavaScript, what HTML or anything was, and started building web applications by using libraries, by using jQuery, by using YOI after I pushed them. And they built a cool application in 24 hours because they didn't have that uh, block that we have in our head that we should do it ourselves. They basically have the idea, we want to build something. Here's technology, how to build it. It's like Lego bricks. We just put the thing together and we build something cool with it. And we don't have to do that ourselves anymore either. So we can learn from these new hackers coming up. And it was, it was pretty impressive what they've done in 24 hours. And because they used out-of-the-box components, they had time to style it. They had time to write proper documentation. And they had time to, to do a usability review with other people. All the stuff that we don't have because we build code and recode and recode every time. So by using out-of-the-box solutions and keeping pragmatic mind, you can quickly build something. And it's, it will work because all the components are tested and they work and they do their job. And if that's not creative enough for you, then actually help the libraries. If you find a bug in, in YUI, then, then, then fix it. If you find a, a problem in the documentation, if you don't understand the documentation, go through it, write your own documentation, send it back to the YUI team. They're happy to put it in there. I mean, it's, 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 it's a team of, of a lot of people working on it, but the outside world always sees more. This is why we release code. This is why I release code to the outside world. I could make money with something like the Flickr thing. But I release it to the outside world so people can implement it in their environments, find bugs that I didn't think of, find use cases that I didn't think of, and that way qualify uh, or make my product better quality because it works for something that I could not have anticipated anyways. So only by using, testing, and improving, we can build better solutions. So uh, not just like reinventing the thing and starting from scratch every time. Use the things that are already out there. Give them a prod, kick the tires of YUI, and build something with it, and then we can make it better. So go out there, uh, give these things a go, and uh, if there's anything that you think could be better, talk to us. Talk to the YUI people. Talk to the jQuery people. Talk to the Dojo guys. All of these things are only better by people using them rather than writing another plugin to do another visual effect. And this is all I wanted to talk about, so I thank you very much. <laughs>